Good morning, everybody. I think it's time we can start our seminar and welcome today to Frontiers in Oncology. And I have the great honor and to introduce our speaker today. And I'm just really sorry that we can't host and have Dr. Stephen Chanick at Stanford campus in person because I think all of us would really enjoy having him here. Dr. Stephen Chanick is director of the NCI um, Division of Cancer Epidemiology and Genetics. Um, he's a leading expert in the discovery and characterization of cancer of susceptibility regions of the human genome. He's an expert in the discovery and characterization of cancer sus susceptibility of I just said that. He has received numerous awards for his scientific contributions of understanding of common inherited genetic variants associated with cancer risk and outcomes. He received his MD degree from Harvard Medical School and completed his clinical training in pediatrics, pediatric infectious diseases, and pediatric hematology oncology and research training in molecular genetics at Boston Children's Hospital and the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston. From 2001 to 2007, he was a tenured investigator in genomic variation section of the pediatric oncology branch at the NCI for cancer research, and he also served as co-chair of NCI's genetic, genomics, and proteomic faculty for five years. In 2001, he was appointed as chief of the Cancer Genomics Research Lab, and then in 2007 as chief of the Laboratory of Translational Genomics, both within DCEG. From 2012 to 2013, he served as acting co-director of the NCI Center for Cancer Genomics. And then in 20, um, um, he was appointed director of DCEG in 2013. And he, um, he was the director after Dr. Joe Fromani, which were huge shoes to fill. And I have to tell you, Stephen has done an incredible job of filling Dr. Fromani's shoes. And I'm sure many of you know who Dr. Fromani is. He was the person who um, was noted for the Lee Fromani cancer family syndrome. And Stephen has done um, an incredible job of, of filling those shoes and serving as the director of DCEG. And he's also, um, as I mentioned, a pediatric oncologist, but a um, epidemiologist that many of us all know and have worked with and has been doing many different kinds of, um, of genomic studies over the years and has been a leader in the field. So just a few things I just want to say for the um, um, for questions and answers, you can either put your questions in the Q&A or you can uh, raise your hand and I can call on you for, the, um, for a question. So either way, we will be monitoring the Q&A. And um, we look forward to his talk on using genomics to investigate radiation-related issues following the Chernobyl accident in 1986. So I'm going to pass it over to Stephen right now. Thank you for your very kind uh, introduction. It's certainly a pleasure to be speaking to colleagues. I'm sorry I'm not there in person, um, but uh, I'm hoping in 2022, there'll be an opportunity as we are starting to see light at the end of the tunnel here at the conservative mothership of the NIH with respect to uh, uh, responding and coming out from underneath the COVID pandemic. And I hope each and every one of you is doing as well as possible. I know I have many friends and colleagues there. And again, thank you, Melissa, for your very kind uh, introduction. Um, this morning, I'm going to talk about sort of an interesting set of stories that come out of a long-term investment of the National Cancer Institute in the radiation epidemiology branch, really first-rate epidemiologic studies asking the question of radiation-related um, uh, outcomes uh, following the Chernobyl accident in 1986. And this is really a very unusual opportunity uh, and one in which we think it's really the first time in which we're able to integrate um, epidemiologic, dosimetric, and genomic uh, information to really start to understand how and in what way uh, radiation actually causes cancer. So uh, let's see. All right. As we know, ionizing radiation is a class one IARC carcinogen. We've known about this for a long time. It's an established risk factor for multiple cancers, particularly in the acute setting with acute leukemia, uh, as well as aplastic anemia. And I'll talk a bit more about thyroid, which is probably the most 
uh, the best studied uh, organ and type of cancer following radiation. Uh, it can have as a complication of therapeutic radiation, second cancers, both in the site and sometimes outside the site, but with much lower incidence, such as in retinoblastoma and the like. And animal studies have been going on for 60 years, 70 years since the Trinity test. Um, some are published in the public domain, and there's a lot more information uh, still uh, behind the um, firewall of the Department of Defense. But I think that the real question is how does how does ionizing radiation actually cause cancer? And so I think we have some first real insights into this looking at human tissues. The Chernobyl nuclear power plant accident occurred uh, about 1.30 in the morning on April 26, 1986 in reactor four. And for nine days, it was an open air core fire and the sarcophagus was eventually put on top of it. Uh, but this was an extraordinarily terrifying and, uh, and tragic event. Uh, the exposure due to uh, all sorts of, um, uh, you know, uh, meteorologic patterns would sort of blew the higher amounts of radiation to different parts of the surrounding area, particularly in northern Ukraine and southern and Belarus, and certainly in, uh, in Russia. And as we know, the very first signs were publicly picked up by Europeans, you know, in the Baltic states, but more importantly in, in Scandinavia and Germany. So we have two different studies that I'm gonna talk about. One is the residential exposure from fallout where there's a very good dosimetric estimate of how much radiation for a discrete period of time people living in the community were exposed to and then was concentrated in the food sources. And then the occupational exposure cohort, the so-called liquidators, who were brought in to clean up and we continue to follow those individuals and uh, asking a different question of transgenerational effects of radiation. So the first story is the environmental radiation exposure and genomic alterations in papillary thyroid carcinoma following the Chernobyl accident. Papillary thyroid cancer has a much higher incidence in women greater than 95% survivorship. It's a cancer of younger adults, uh, AYA and individuals in their 40s and 50s. We certainly see it in older, but it, but it has a very interesting incidence pattern. It's highly differentiated. The mutational burden is higher with older patients. And I'll talk a little bit about the TCGA data. And there's been a lot of interest in the BRAF 600 and the TERP promoter mutations that can actually drive therapeutic decisions in this country and in Europe. So here is the so-called landscape analysis of 470 plus uh, papillary thyroid cancers from the Cancer Genome Atlas that were published in Cell in 2014. And there are a couple of things that are remarkable about this. One is the mutational burden is rather low. The second is the uh, types of mutations, as you can see in this middle bar here, the significant BP mutations, uh, point mutations in BRAF and then HK and NRAS account for about over 70%. And then there's about 15% or a little bit less that have fusion proteins that are two different genes being uh, uh, stitched together. And, and most of these are also map to the uh, mitogen activated uh, protein kinase pathway, the so-called MAP kinase. But about 25%, we don't have a good explanation for. It's quiet with respect to large scale changes in the genome as represented by SCNAs. And then the driver summary is below. So what do we know about exposures in somatic mutations? Well, unfortunately, uh, and I say this from the epidemiologic point of view, TCGA and the ICGC paid very little attention to exposures and environmental drivers, as well as ancestral background. Early on, we were worried about how much tissue we could get. And so a lot of the procurement was uh, with advanced large disease with vir virtually no epidemiologic information. And as we know, uh, spotty clinical follow-up. Uh, there's been a lot of effort to continue to do that, but it really is a, it, we've paid the price of not making those prospective decisions early on. Um, it's mutational signatures we see are forensic tools for epidemiology, looking at endogenous and exogenous processes. And I'll come back to the cosmic approach towards this, which we certainly have applied here, but allows us to map select exposures. So we set out asking the question, could we see, for instance, mutational signatures, single base changes, that had particular patterns 
that could be correlated with radiation. In other words, is there a biomarker for saying this tumor had a radiogenic component to it? That, that's one of the essential questions that we started out. Um, but uh, my key point, I think, is going forward, and I think now with the Center for Cancer Genome, Genomics, led by Lou Stout, uh, really gets this, that we can't forget the context of the cancer genome analyses. So let's go back to the uh, question of who we were studying. If we look at the younger ages of individuals who were exposed to I-131, a number of pooled cohorts, both following uh, Chernobyl and uh, in other settings, you could clearly see a major difference in the risk for papillary thyroid carcinoma in individuals who are under five years of age at exposure, those who were five to 15 and those who were over 15. And then of course the, the dose that they were exposed to. So we really, we were particularly interested as we move forward with the Chernobyl study of those individuals who were under 18 who had uh, exposure. So um, we know that the residential exposure comes from the fallout of I-131, which is something that we clearly can measure. Uh, and we could see from meteorologic patterns that's deposition in food sources and concentration, you know, uh, in cows and the like. Remember, this is 1986, and food sources in the Soviet Union were rather restricted. They were for sustenance, but by no means was there much in the way of of, of real variety. So the milk, was, uh, cow's milk was a major source for younger kids uh, up, you know, up through age 12 and 15 per se. So our project was one in which we used the resources that the NCI had been supporting for a long time, the so-called Chernobyl Tissue Bank. Um, we uh, were able to get fresh frozen material from 440 cases that had been pathologically confirmed by a, um, by a panel of six experts from around the world. And we were able to do a TCGA-like activity with high quality whole genome sequencing, RNA sequencing, uh, SNP chip, methylation chip, uh, and relative telomere length quantification. This is with short read uh, next generation sequencing, and we are now embarking on uh, some very select use of PacBio and the like to ask some uh, questions I'll come to later. But we had, in the end, 359 individuals with well quantified. Um, I-131 exposure in 81, who were born in other parts of Ukraine nine months later. So we had a kind of control group that really en enabled us to be able to ask this question, what does radiation exposure and as a continuous variable look like in terms of the uh, downstream genomic events that would be associated with developing papillary thyroid cancer. So we looked at simple somatic variants, microsatellite structural variants, drivers, and this question of fusions versus mutations, copy number, mRNA, microRNA, methylation, and then the transcript, uh, transcriptional patterns that we had seen in TCGA. Um, which uh, we knew about. And then was there any germline variation? And interestingly enough, we really didn't see any rare variants that appeared to, to be important for individuals with low dose or moderate dose of radiation exposure. So here is our landscape uh, plot of our, uh, of our study here. And here, unlike any other landscape plots, we're able to actually show the exposure to the radiation from very good dosimetric data. This is a huge investment that NCI and the Ukrainians and others have, have put into this over the last 30 years. Uh, and we're able to look at those individuals, the 81 who we know had no exposure to radiation and then low dose one to 99, 100 to, uh, to 200, more than 200 and then more than 500 uh, milligray. And this is, what you can see, what's very interesting is if we look down here where I've written driver mutation, just look at the shift and the red tells us that those are point mutations and the blue are the fusions. As you can see, the higher the radiation exposure, the more likely there is a fusion driver and how that comes about and why that comes about is something that I'm going to talk about in, in, in a minute. So first and foremost, we ask the question, what's the mutational burden with whole genome sequencing, 80X coverage, uh, 
for the whole genome, uh, somatic tissue and 35 to 40 X for the germline in this study, we could see that adult TCGA is pretty quiet in terms of the total number of variants per sample. In other words, how many mutations per million bases. Uh, and we know that smoking and UV driven can have two and three orders of magnitude more due to the environmental exposure. And interestingly enough, when we looked at our Chernobyl thyroid, it was very quiet. This is in the same sort of space that we see some of the pediatric cancers like um, uh, Ewing sarcoma and rhabdomyosarcoma. Really quite striking. We were a bit surprised, but it's uh, the first hint that uh, single base mutations really are not uh, being generated by uh, ionizing radiation. And I'll show you the data. When we looked at the drivers, we could see candidate drivers in 90, almost 99%, in 90, almost 94% overall mapped to just the MAP kinase pathway. So there is an, there's a parsimony, there's an efficiency to how these tumors develop and they need just one driver. We don't see much in the way of subclonality as well. So these are efficient and effective. Once either a BRAF or a fusion that involves a gene that's critical for MAP kinase sets its course, it moves rather quickly. And uh, we can talk a little bit about the timing using both methylation clocks and uh, mutational signatures. But it's really quite striking to see uh, such a high fraction of cancers being uh, mapping to a very particular small uh, set of genes that are part of a critical pathway. And it really relates, we think, to some very important developmental questions and lineage-specific questions that we are continuing on with. Interestingly enough, in the older cases, TCGA had as, had as an average age well above 45 to 50. Here, we're looking at cases where the average age is some 24, 25, and all the exposure was before age 18. So 20% of TCGA had uh, TERT promoter mutations, whereas we saw only one in 386 in the Chernobyl study cases, which really, how much of this is an age-related issue and how much may be, may be related to radiation, something that uh, we can't sort out yet, but the ongoing studies will hopefully help us to give uh, more insights into that per se. Interestingly enough, there are these questions of lineage-defining genes, as Matt Myerson and others have defined in, in some other diseases, uh, such as liver, and, and they look a little bit in thyroid and, and stomach and, and, and lung, we were able to look much more closely and could see that the uh, thyroglobulin gene has a high number of lineage-defining genes, uh, particularly the thyroglobulin that had many mutations but uh, with a very different ratio of the coding to non-coding as opposed to BRAF. And we saw nearly all of them are intronic and none of them were really predicted to have um, a substantial effect in, in, as oncogenic drivers per se. So again, we could see these lineage act, this lineage activity and in normal tissue, which we are non-tumor tissue that is radiated, we're now starting down the road. And our first analysis did not really suggest a field effect. So the question is, was this thyroglobulin a mutation, a consequence of the background mutations that take place in the thyroid in any tissue, or could this be radiation induced? And we, we favor the former, but more data is needed to really address that. So when we looked at the fusions themselves, we could see an increase in fusions with radiation dose. Uh, so if we looked at the EOR, which is the uh, excess odds ratio per 100 milligray, where we're able to model and do a very sophisticated analysis of using gene environment interactions here per se, we could see an increase in the number of indels and structural variants. And I'll unravel each of those in a little bit because I think those latter two give us real insight into how the radiation is causing the cancer. And we really couldn't identify particular radiation biomarkers. But the key thing here is the fusion drivers. The higher the radiation dose, the greater the likelihood that the individual has a fusion egg, uh, protein as the driver. As I indicated when I showed the landscape, we can clearly see this uh, at, at a very strong effect in the PTC. So when we started to look at 
signature analysis where we took all of the background single base mutations and looking at the different combinations as described and, and first really cataloged by the cosmic signature analyses with programs that both Gaddy gets a, a close a collaborator and Ludmil uh, uh, Alexandrov out in now at UCSD who was in the Sanger. We looked at these combinations thinking that could we see a signature for radiation exposure itself and interestingly enough, we really didn't. What we saw was a predominance of the two clock signatures, the background uh, events that particularly involve a C to T mutation. And then we saw a background of 15.1% of the SBS8. But when we, again, did this analysis looking at, uh, you know, as a function of radiation, we did not see any relationship of, of SBS8 with respect to radiation. A little bit of background of APOBEC, again, no radiation association. These are things, APOBEC and ROS were each identified in the TCGA, but we didn't see any real relationship to um, radiation dose. When we then went to the next sort of level of small insertions of lesions, we saw jumping off the page, uh, the so-called ID8, and we saw to a degree ID6, which are these small little repeat, uh, more than one base deletions at repeats that were roughly five deletions or more, or six or seven, as well as microhomology. And these were things that um, we knew about from some of the animal data with very high dose radiation, but to now see this in humans with, again, one of the points I wanna make, I should have said this earlier on, is when we look at Chernobyl, it's a very discrete radiation exposure over a matter of weeks to months at a low steady level. This is very different than the hyperfractionated uh, discrete bursts of therapeutic radiation that clearly we see in, in radi radiation oncology suites per se. Uh, there is some similarity, but um, what, what was really interesting was again, to see the effect of radiation on the small deletions themselves. So the higher the radiation dose, the more uh, IDH signature that we saw. But the question is how much? Can we quantify this to the point of saying there's a biomarker if we see X amount of ID8, does that mean it's a radiogenic tumor? No, we can't quite say that yet. Um, when we looked at, interestingly enough, the ratio of the number of deletions, small deletions against the background of the SNV ratio, knowing that there's a steady rate, particularly of clock mutations, we could see an even stronger effect uh, with respect to the effect of radiation on small deletions. Now, there are two papers that I wanted to call your attention to. One out of the Sanger back in 2016 that looked at just 12 uh, cases of secondary cancers in radiation fields and second malignancies, and they saw uh, this enrichment of microhomology and particularly the indel signature 8. And around the time that our paper was, we published our paper in March and a couple months later, Nature Genetics, um, uh, Flores Bartel and Raul Verkic looked at particularly brain tumors that had received radiotherapy and they saw similarly a, a real enrichment. The higher the radiation dose, the greater the burden of indel signatures eight that were seen as a background. They didn't see the fusion proteins. That's a different question. We can come back to that in the question and answer. So we then also wanted to look at the structural variants. These are things that are going on, as we know, in the nuclear regulatory industry. Uh, chromosomal translocations are used as a, as a rough biomarker for someone exceeding a certain amount of radiation exposure. So we, with our short read technology, wanted to look at deletions, inversions, uh, reciprocal translocations and the like, as well as seeing very little chromoplexy or chromothripsis per se as structural events. So these more simple events we categorized together. And since we had both RNA and DNA data, we could go look very specifically uh, in select cases such as the fusion drivers at what the local sequence was right around those structural variants. So we could see that the increase in dose was associated with an increase in SVs in structural variants, particularly of those simple balanced, where it's a simple event of one part of the chromosome being stuck to another part as opposed 
to the more complex chromoplexies and chromothripsis that you see in some of the adult, adult but certainly pediatric sarcomas. We didn't see an association of dose with the much rarer complex SVs, which represent a very small fraction. Uh, and again, no real sign of a radiation biomarker that we could say, aha, this tumor was caused by radiation with 100% certainty, which is something I think that the industry wants, but the science is not quite there yet. So we asked the question, gee, since we have very good definition, very good coverage, 80x coverage of the tumor and 35 to 40x of the, of the germline, could we look and ask the question, could we see the vestiges of different kinds of double strand break repair mechanisms that uh, the radiation may be inducing uh, in this context? And so here, this is just from a classic review, and we particularly were interested in very short deletions and insertions and asking the question of whether non-homologous end joining or alternative end joining in some of the larger uh, high fidelity repair uh, mechanisms can be seen. So we then looked at the specific small deletion repair mechanisms, looking at those where there were five bases or more, and we could really see the amount of microhomology in, in, at the deletion boundary differentiates end joining repair types. So here in human tissues that have received radiation exposure, we could see non what looks like NHEJ, and then with the larger, uh, a mixture of the two. When we then uh, looked at this per se, looking at the one, you know, the one base microhomology and then greater than two, we could see that each of these have very strong correlations specifically with radiation exposure. Really in our minds, again, as a very strong correlative finding suggesting that non-homologous end joining is the way in which we are seeing these kinds of events, whether it's a generation of a fusion driver or a background uh, event of an indel, um, or for that matter, a different kind of structural variant that may not include a, a driver gene itself. Um, so our conclusion was that NHEJ is the primary DNA double strand break repair mechanism. Um, we then asked this question looking at the clonal setting, and, and we know the vast majority of our tumors, tumors were quite clonal in the sense of we did not see like you see in the environmentally exposed UV or, or lung cancers where you can have five, six, or seven subclones that are evolving uh, you know, in, in asynchronous manners. Here, we could see clonal simple balance SVs um, and really enriched for the non-homologous end joining, those smaller indels that we could see. When we looked at the confirmed clonal SVs, the simple and balanced were even stronger, uh, whereas the other type of SVs on the right, you could see we didn't see anything really of significance. So again, a metric we were using is the excess odds ratio for that event taking place per 100 milligrams. So this is a different kind of analysis than we've ever been able to do in TCGA-like studies, where, again, the environmental exposure is well characterized and allows us to to infer and begin to ask questions and answer questions as to how and in what way a, a discrete exposure leads to a very specific uh, cancer event. Consistent association, regardless of the amount of the loss or gain, as you can see, was really also very reassuring to us and telling us that it wasn't necessarily focused just on a one or two base or a very large 10 or 20 base. Um, we then also looked at the templated insertions or TINs as a specific to the alt EJ, and we didn't see any exposure uh, with a radiation exposure. Again, more correlative evidence really pushing us more towards non-homologous end joining as the critical type of event that would lead to the fusion drivers as well as the background events that we see that really correlated or associated with radiation exposure. We also looked at somatic copy number alterations, and we could see that chromosome 22Q rep was uh, much more frequent than anything else. And this had been seen in TCGA, who thought that that was a driver. But when we looked at our study, we didn't see any correlation with radiation exposure. What was of interest, though, was that when you had a particular point mutation driver such as RAS mutation or the BRAF 600, we saw really very strong correlation between this 22Q and the RAS mutation, okay? When we looked at the mRNA clustering, we did not see any radiation dose effect. 
But what we did see, again, what's, again, I mentioned this term before, this sort of the parsimony, that once a driver has set its course, so to speak, with these PTCs, both the mRNA, the expression profile, and the epigenetic really follow that. So we could see major differences between BRAF and RAS as a function of the driver, but not as a function of the radiation dose itself. We saw this from micro uh, microRNA as well as expression profiles in methylation. We looked at common and uncommon germline variation, and we saw a, a, an, an intriguing finding, and that is the less radiation that someone had, the greater, quote unquote, the potential effect of a PRS that had already been generated, um, a polygenic risk score for thyroid based on 12 previously reported thyroid cancer SNPs. But this really needs more work to really be followed up. But it just tells us that the sporadic may very well have had their genetic backgrounds, but we don't see an enhancement of radiation-related um, PTC in individuals who have particular underlying uh, genetic predisposition. So really, our, we had a paper that came out in, in March, uh, well, actually two, and I'll talk about the second, that really to sort of uh, recap, we could see the exposure that was concentrated and then it's clearly causing double-stranded DNA breaks and thyroid cancer. And when we looked at those landscape analyses, we could see a direct relationship between the DNA double-strand breaks and the radiation dose, and particularly in generating certain types of driver mutations. So our key findings are really 90, over 93% of the driver mutations in MAP kinase, the double strand breaks, the profiles of both epigenetic and gene expression were determined by the cancer driver mutation and washed out any kind of biomarker for radiation. And it's really a very parsimonious mutational profile. So I'm going to talk for like three or four minutes before I go to a, a last uh, brief discussion. We had, we now have the opportunity, this is all unpublished data that I'm showing, looking at uh, metastases after the Chernobyl accident. So 60 to 70% of the related thyroid cancers had cervical lymph node metastases. Um, and so we had access to some 49 of them. We, one of them we removed for QC reasons. And interestingly enough, a very a much higher fraction had the a fusion protein versus a, uh, a single mutational driver per se. Uh, we're now extending this with uh, further uh, known metastases to actually in those 440, we already know who has the metastases and that analysis is going on. But just looking at particularly the characteristics, we could see that they share a very high fraction, but not perfectly overlapping between the primary and the metastasis. What is really quite striking is the, on RNA differential expression. I, I should have also mentioned that the driver genes are identical between the primary and the metastasis. We don't see new drivers in MAP kinase or in other genes that may be quote unquote responsible for the metastasis occurring, particularly in the local region. So we had this opportunity to do the same kind of comparison to our primary using, um, you know, the same uh, technologies of TCGA. And what was interesting was here, the expression changes, we could see the Hox genes and the DLX were just sort of off the chart. And, and this, was, this came as a surprise, given that we didn't see these as radiation effects uh, when we looked at non-tumor uh, thyroid tissue compared to uh, the thyroid uh, cancer itself. Um, but uh, this really gives us, I think, an insight into metastases. And it's not at all clear that this is due to radiation per se. There is a debate about whether radiation itself increases the likelihood of metastases. And uh, depending on where you are in the world, there are different positions on that, okay, in our colleagues. So the Hox genes and the DLX genes each have interesting biologies of, of the Hox related to epithelial mesenchymal transition and the DLX family linked to TGF beta. So our next steps, we have a about the comparable number of FFPEs, where we have many more with long, uh, younger age and higher doses. Uh, we're also looking at multifocal individuals and pursuing the field effect, the fact that we don't see that in our normal uh, non-tumor tissue at this time. And we're gonna be probably partnering with the uh, Sanger to look at this with NanoSeq and other particular ways. So 
Uh, the number of people who have been instrumental in this particular study, particularly Lindsay Morton and Danielle Cariotti, and certainly Jerry Thomas, and the collaboration with Gaddy Getz at the Broad Institute have really been marvelous. So let me, for the, another seven or eight minutes, talk about a second study where a different question was being asked, and that is, is there a transgenerational effect? If somebody receives a given amount of radiation, are subsequent generations going to be affected by that? This is a question that's been profoundly important in the Fukushima uh, fallout question. Um, and uh, we thought that we could address this in the after the Chernobyl accident. And we, in fact, have. We designed, I traveled to Ukraine several times and designed a family study. We were able to identify individuals who had known exposures, either the mother or father or both, and then had adult children. So there's a bias here. We're not looking at the very acute exposures um, and doing very high whole genome sequencing, asking the question, can we find de novo mutations? In other words, the building blocks of, of, of selection, of, of, um, <clears throat> of evolution, so to speak, the random mutations that occur in every generation uh, both in the spermanocytes, that a small number of variants are generated, somewhere in the order of 40 to 80 per each generation. And these are DNMs, de novo mutations, where they're not seen in either the mother or father. Um, and there's, it's the only class of genomic variation to not undergo purifying selection. And DNMs, you know, particularly are important in the autism world, but in, in a number of catastrophic uh, pediatric developmental conditions that are very rare. Um, and uh, this is where it can only be ascertained by a, a, a very thorough, a rigorous uh, family design, which we have put in place. We know that from the Icelanders and from the Inova group across the river here in Virginia, that sequencing, high definition sequencing with short read uh, technology has been able to look at and really categorize and estimate what the expected number of de novo mutations are per generation. And it's somewhere in the range of 40 to 70. We know it increases with paternal age, and I'll certainly come back to that. And there's a small effect in maternal age as well. This is a long-standing controversy on transgenerational effects. So animal data, which looked very different. Uh, again, I remind you here in our Chernobyl study, this is a protracted exposure over weeks to months uh, at a steady level as opposed to a very high acute uh, dose uh, as, is, as is often, uh, which is the case in radiation oncology. Uh, we know that from animal data that there is evidence of double strand breaks, particularly to the high dose, with structural and chromosomal uh, events, but no real single base mutational signature. Uh, human studies, there were a few anecdotal studies after Chernobyl of looking at microsatellites, that's little repeats of DNA that are anywhere from two to five bases that are repeated multiple times. Small underpowered studies gave a handful of very anecdotal and sometimes contradictory findings. And then uh, in, in uh, survivors of the Nagasaki uh, blast, there were three families that were sequenced, that, again, very anecdotal. So uh, the principle here was to be able to sequence the mother, the father, and the child at very high uh, levels. So we did 80x, not 30 to 35x, which is the typical germline, because we didn't want to miss informatically. And we played the game for a period of time of hide the uh, BAM files and hide the uh, different components that are randomly that were generated to see what we uh, can detect or not detect. So the vast majority of variants we could see are inherited either from mother or father or both in the child. There are these Mendelian inconsistency errors that Many of them are sequencing errors and we applied different filters and we had five different programs. And then we actually manually reviewed with IGF every single putative uh, variant. Meredith Yeager, the first author, and Mike Dean and others did this. And it took them several months to do that to come upon what we think are the true de novo mutations. So when we looked at the association, particularly knowing the dosimetric exposure, the amount of radiation that each mother and father had, and we had a certain amount of epidemiologic data with smoking and alcohol and the like, we saw no effect of smoking, uh, but we did see a very strong effect of the paternal age here, as you can see, uh, for the father. And this was something that has been well-established 
Uh, with each year, there's an increasing risk for uh, additional more uh, DNMs in a, in a generation uh, with the paternal age. But there is some evidence for maternal, and I'll come back to that. When we looked at the cumulative radiation dose and we used multiple models, we saw no effect whatsoever. So for the very high doses to the very low doses, we saw no effect on total DNM counts. So when we were able to assess the parent of origin, so about 42% of the DNMs, we had adjacent um, markers that we could look at and assign to either the mother or the father. We could clearly see when we get to that more specific uh, level, we could see the paternal age clearly is still strongly there, but we could also see a maternal effect. And this really corresponds with what both the INOVA and particularly the uh, Icelanders have recently published. And there are now some other groups in Utah that have certainly confirmed this. When we looked at the sensitivity analysis of cumulative radiation dose, uh, truncated uh, cumulative log radiation dose, many different ways of doing this, we could not see a signal per se. Um, and when we then looked at specifically the types of events, so not all DNMs are identical. There are, the majority of them are single base like SNPs or SNVs, and then they're microsatellites, and then they're indels, as you can see here, and then there are clusters and complexes, which are relatively rare, which we saw on the order of maybe one or two per individual. Uh, and these have been anecdotally pointed out in survivors of the Hiroshima blast in a couple of case reports, but it's really hard to do anything but beyond, beyond being anecdotal, to have any real statistical basis to say, yes, there is a relationship between radiation dose or radiation exposure and these specific kinds of events. So for SNVs, we clearly did not see anything. When we then compared the types of of mutations, in other words, the single base change, they were basically identical between our study and the published studies uh, from the Icelanders, from the Danes, from Utah, from uh, INOVA and the like. And so <clears throat> we have concluded that the single base change is not affected by radiation. And that's not at all inconsistent with what we saw with the thyroid uh, cancers that we were talking about earlier, a half hour ago. Uh, we were able to do this, but we know that there are different genome builds and pipelines and validation. Uh, we, for some of these, we have ongoing collaborations to get the actual biome files to make sure that the calls are identical, because we're talking about a small number of events. And so a change in 10 or 15% of the events uh, in our analysis could have um, some material effect. So when we look at this, the study considerations, the evaluation of peripheral blood of adult children conceived months to years after the accident. We didn't have any children born right away where either the mother was um, already pregnant at the time or of their exposure as a liquidator or living in that region or within the first uh, couple of months. So there is a survivor bias, but this is still an important public health question that you can imagine in Fukushima and certainly is uh, still highly debated and of concern to uh, survivors of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki blasts. And certainly the nuclear regulatory industry is very interested in this. So we were unable to investigate very high doses where individuals would have acute uh, radiation sickness uh, in their immediate aftermath. Uh, we use short sequence technology plus SNP chips and methylation chips for this, and we have some packed bio in selected individuals that are ongoing at this time with long range. So adequate power to identify substantive increase in DNMs in adult children born to liquidators. We saw no real increase in DNMs observed to radiation, and the epigenetic signatures were clearly not there between uh, the, the generations. Doses were both extended and lower than animal studies. And this raises this very interesting point that when we published our paper in science, one of the reviewers was adamant that we included this uh, uh, discussion about the balance between new gonadal DNMs and DNA repair. So this is a fundamental question in the generation of DNMs. And here, this, you know, it's something that as we extend our studies, we may have more human data that sheds light on this, but I think models are gonna be critical for addressing that particular question. <clears throat> 
So the risk of deleterious DNMs we think is very small if it exists. The timing of radiation can be critical. And we have further studies with Chernobyl uh, trios as well as the survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki blast. They've been looking at this uh, non-genetically and we've been in extended conversations for quite some time to try and do this in their F1 studies. It's not clear if it's worthwhile for the very lower doses. Remember, Fukushima is basically almost an order of magnitude lower than what we saw in Chernobyl. Um, I would also say that we're in the midst of looking at clonal hematopoiesis and genetic mosaicism in these, in this, in these particular studies. We have over 250 families now. And we know that uh, radiation uh, therapy can have an increase in clonal hematopoiesis with select genes like TERT2 and TP53. So we're going to be very interested to see if this sort of moderate to low steady dose over an extended period of time may increase the risk for clonal hematopoiesis and or genetic mosaicism. So this work really was uh, co-led by Meredith Yeager and Mitch Makila here in uh, DCG with uh, marvelous collaborators from around the world. Again, Dmitry Bazika in, in the Ukraine and certainly our colleagues elsewhere. So with that, let me uh, say my talk has come to a conclusion. Thank you very much for your attention. And for those young trainees, DCG is a marvelous place to come do postdoctoral fellowship or pre-doctoral work. We have 130 trainees and many have gone on to do marvelous things. And we, we have a wide range of very distinctive activities that uh, we'd like to put in front of you. But with that, I will stop sharing and uh, Melissa, turn it back to you. Wow, Stephen, and what an incredible amount of work. It's just, you know, we, I think so many of us keep thinking we, um, that radiation exposure, we all know it's important and trying to understand it even more. And I always use the radiation exposure from the Tinea Capitis um, cohort from Israel as being an important exposure for developing brain tumors. And I don't, you know, we've seen some of the genetics and I don't think that they have the same kind of data to really understand this, you know, some of the, the, the molecular landscape that you've been able to show here, which is unfortunate. I think, I know there are samples and they've looked at the genotypes, but I don't think that there's been anything like the um, rigor of data that are even available to be able to look at those kinds of things. But again, these kids were exposed at young ages and, you know, it's, we saw that, you know, almost like natural experiments that were done. Um, but the work that you presented is just really, really amazing. And um, so, incredible in terms of how much you've been able to, to, to be able to decipher from all of that. Um, you know, the family data that you presented with the kids, I mean, of course, that was really interesting to me. Do you think that the, you know, the, the Nagasaki and Hiroshima data, because I think they collected samples, I'm not sure, over all those years, if there's even the same kind of data available to even go back and look at that. And, but, you know, those families and data, of, yes. you know, some of it's available. Well, Do you they, think you they... can go back? Yeah, they, they have, and um, they've done some, you know, quote unquote, dry epidemiologic studies, and you can uh -huh. see very early exposure. The problem is the databases for, for tumors and tumor registries were really not in place in the after the 45 bomb blast and for a good 15 to 20 years. And so the acute leukemia is in a number of the really uh, horrific outcomes uh, that are non-cancer were really all anecdotally uh, characterized. I, I see uh, from Jim Ford a very interesting question yeah, about the clinical phenotype. So the in our transgenerational study, so we have the liquidator cohort and we are prospectively studying the liquidators and similarly now the adult children. And so we've done extensive questionnaires uh, and, and gone back. And what's interesting is we have not seen major clinical most clinical phenotypes. One of the interesting things, you know, in in March and April when we were presenting this at the 35th anniversary, and you know, I spoke for the Ukrainian uh, National Academy of Sciences several times. To the Ukrainians, their 
tremendous psychological implications and and manifestations and we're it's hard to map those but if you you know getting it whether it's diabetes or cataracts or hypertension or or cancer and like we don't see major upticks in sort of chronic disease issues in again there's a bias here these are adult children they had to survive a given period of time uh, you know, in 1986, in 1987, 88 was a pretty rough time in parts of the Soviet Union, um, particularly after the Chernobyl disaster when there was a lot of, of chaos. Um, the developmental defects, uh, how we assess that is a terrific question, and we've made some inquiries, but that's a hard place where I'm afraid we may not capture as much information as we would like. So. Crystal, I said, hi, Crystal, you have a question. Yeah, so you voice. can see hi, those. Crystal. There's also somebody in the chat, Stephen, that has a question. So John Witt, no? Yeah. I, th I think John does too. So let's go to Crystal and then we can, a um, couple sure. of other people. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, Stephen, great to see you and to see, you know, your continued leadership and just the stream of highly impactful work out of DCEG. Just great. Um, so as I was listening and, and, uh, you know, thinking about the implications from my vantage point, the field of stem uh, cell and gene therapy is really struggling to come to grips with what are the risks associated with CRISPR-based cell engineering. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, now, you know, the CRISPR being kind of the gold standard, but the problem with CRISPR is it induces double strand breaks. And, um, you know, we're infusing cells with point mutations, but also translocations. And, you know, it's hard to measure the translocations. And, you know, there are those who say, well, you know, we all have translocations, you know, we have BCR able circulating in our systems, but yep. are you, do you think there are any lessons learned from this deep dive around what might be a threshold level or some signal above which the risk might be too much? Well, it's, a, it's an excellent question because just for the field of radiation itself and radiation exposure, we were somewhat surprised that we are not able to come up with distinctive biomarkers. Now, as we extend our numbers, you know, we're doubling with FFPE and we're trying to get samples out of Belarus, um, but the recent news is pretty much going to squash that for quite an extended period of time. The, the issue is, can we look at sets of things? If you know you have more than X number of indels or or structural variants that aren't necessarily fusion, does that tell you that it, you know there's a that you have a radiogenic event that's taken place? You know there is this sort of randomness of where it takes these events take place, but also I mean what's really quite striking is in papillary thyroid cancer, they're happening all in this very discrete pathway, the MAP kinase. So uh, I, I think that we have an advantage to what you're facing with, with the CRISPR. And I think to me, the, the really the, the key issue is, is really going to be, um, if I may say, at least thinking about doing RNA analysis, just not DNA analysis on the materials that you have, okay? because you find the fusions much more easily from RNA uh, data than you do from uh, any kind of DNA. You can find it in DNA, but you have to know and go literally go to IGV and look and see, ah, that's where the cassette stops and that's where another gene picks up per se. But I, I, I think Crystal, at least for some period of time, you may want to think about RNA-seq data on, on the samples that you have, okay? Yep, thank you, Steve. So I think, um, Daniel, do you have a question, Daniel? Um, Cap? Yeah, I, I, can, I can answer that. It, interestingly enough, Daniel, when we have 440 cases now and we have another 475 coming, we, we spend a lot of time. I mean, my background is more in germline wanting to ask this question. Where are we going to find you know, uh, TP15, you know, a Lee Fraumeni syndrome or a BRCA1 or two or a patch or, you know, any number of these rare telomerase related mutations in, you know, POT1 or something like that. And we really didn't see anything come out of this. Granted, the numbers are, are, are not that large, 
uh, you know, 440. We have, we'll probably be at about a thousand uh, by the time we finish, you know, by our next sort of milestone 18 months from now. But it was quite striking not to see any BRCA1 or 2 mutations. We know what the background is in the Ukrainian population per se. I mean, there are studies that look, have looked at that, but I, we wonder how much of that is a sampling question as well. Um, you know, most of these, most of the kids were from the rural Pripyat, the region around the Ukraine. So from the agricultural belt per se, and there's, we have an interesting population genetics analysis going on that may be politically quite explosive in the Ukraine, but we're going to wait to publish that till we get some more data as, as we've started to try and reconstruct a sort of a population genetics map of, of what parts of the Ukraine look like and the and uh, it, it may be very complicated, but we were surprised not to see any of the, you know, the cancer predisposition genes uh, showing up in any way. Would you have expected with the number you had based on the population genetics? No, well, no, we, we wouldn't have, uh, you know, but, you know, hope springs eternal. So we, we, we thought, gee, you know, could, because not everybody who gets radiation exposure necessarily develops papillary thyroid cancer. And so the question was, could there have been an enrichment? Even if we saw three or four BRCA1 and 2s, we would have been really intrigued, but we, we just didn't see anything. I, I think we saw one and it wasn't a very interesting uh, mutation from the BRCA exchange. It's interesting because my background is from Kiev. My, my grandparents were from there and there are BRCA mutations in the Ashkenazim. Absolutely. In that region. Right. But remember, most of the cases we have are, are more um, in the north and to the west. And those are agricultural. And this is where right. we can see. So we have, a fair, you know, the controls that we have, the 81, some of them came from South Kiev, et cetera. And so we are extending that with uh, Taras and other colleagues. Uh, and it, it, you really do see, you know, big regional differences that reflect where the shuttles were and where they were unfortunate pogroms, et cetera, that eliminated part of the Jewish population or forced them elsewhere. And so that's, that's one of the things that when we start to publish, I think will be somewhat controversial in okay. Ukraine. As are, you know, the, the, the clouds covered lots of Eastern Europe. So yeah. Austria was also exposed and very concerned. Uh, so that's yeah. another area that one could look into. Well, the, the, we have, I mean, we, the Belarus is actually, the Southern Belarus got even higher doses and we have done a number of dry epidemiologic studies, but we've never been able, we've got 10 samples out. That was four years ago when I went there and spent two days in the, with the ministry, um, but they just won't share their materials. Um, and we know that there are some Russian cases that are part of the Chernobyl tissue bank. But by the time you get to Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, which is the next sort of wind pattern, those doses are much, much lower. Okay, they're in the sort of the Fukushima level where you have to ask the question. Are we seeing sporadic background rare pediatric uh, papillary thyroid cancer as opposed to a radiogenic? Uh, you know, their probability of causation is much, much lower. Thank you for your excellent work. Steve, we have one more question from Jim. I mean, I had questions too, but I'm going to let you ask Jim's and it's 8.58. So we're going to have to sign off after you answer Jim's. And it's, uh, Jim, do you want to ask it or do you want Stephen just to read it? maybe with the time, he asked the question, were, the measurable, were there measurable clinical phenotype changes in kids from radiation exposed parents, increased developmental um, defects? Oh, well, um, Melissa, I think I, I started out by answering that. Oh, you know, okay, I'm about, sorry. About the, I should have no, about that. the phenotyping, you know, about the chronic versus okay. the okay. psychiatric issues. And, and that's a, a much more complicated issue. So, okay. Some of the psychiatric geneticists have come to us and want to go back into the Ukraine, but I think the numbers are small for, for those kinds of questions. In, very interesting, very compelling, but uh, nonetheless very small. Have, other, uh, have you seen other cancers, any leukemias or other cancers you would have expected to see from radiation exposure? Well, it's interesting for the um, liquidators cohort, we're now seeing CLL sort of lift off. And similarly for the environmental, the younger individuals, we're starting to see breast cancer. So we actually have a breast cancer cohort that we're starting. And, and Ned Sharpless pointed this out, our director, 
the I-131, there is a certain amount of uptake in the mammary gland. You know, thyroid is where the vast majority goes, but if you look at uh, some of the interesting studies, uh, you can see it in the mammary gland. So we're, we're looking very specifically at breast cancer in women who had the environmental exposure. As you can imagine, the liquidate is only a very small fraction mm -hmm. where women, you know, eight to 10%, and they were more in the background you know, as cooks and, and people looking after the liquidators who are going into the sarcophagus and the like. Mm -hmm. Well, we've reached the nine o'clock hour and I want to thank you, Stephen, for such an incredible talk. And um, we will definitely have you here in person uh, after the pandemic allows us to travel. And we've talked about doing a joint uh, symposium together and we really Absolutely. need to start talking about it. And we're really happy that you were able to come. So we will be seeing you soon. And um, thanks again for participating in our Frontiers um, uh, Symposium. Well, it's been a pleasure and wonderful to see and hear many of you and look forward to seeing you in person out in right. Palo Alto. Thank you. Oh, it's All beautiful right. today. So great. Thanks so much. All right. Bye-bye.